every time we tried to lift it up, it just kept ripping. So the only way to make this squid ink crepe soft enough to actually like hold is uh, you have to steam it again, like lightly. And then you have to take your little fingers, you know what I mean? And just like, just somebody hold it up and somebody just tie this little double knot of a <laughs> garlic chive so I can hold it up. And <laughs> basically like this right here, this is just a documentation of like, I mean, I hope, I hope some people like it, but for me, it's like a documentation of failing about at least 30 times, Ooh, you know, wow. which is the tough part about the creative process. Mm -hmm. yep. For example, like I was joking with uh, Randy, one of the cooks yesterday, I just had my head down in my, in my, my arms and I was like, Randy, look, this is what they don't teach you in culinary school, bro. Like this is the creative process. You're just hating yourself so much. <laughs> because every time something doesn't work out, it just feels like you're a failure. Mm. You know? And uh, I wish I was one of those people that's like, oh, didn't work? Cool, try it again. Oh, didn't work? Cool, try it again. But for me, it's like, get yourself out of that space. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Come on, come on, try, try. And yeah. And just, just keep working at it. It's and then, frustrating. Yeah, you know. Because um, you don't know if it's ever going to turn out. Yeah, right. And then eventually you just get these small wins and you just keep holding on to those small wins you know what i mean like oh, okay this this tastes good or like oh this this worked like oh this actually is decent like oh this this little this percentage like oh this little technique difference hi i'm nadine back for another episode of thursday tables today i'm heading for restaurant exo for a peek into one chef's creative process as they prepare to launch a new menu on august 10. There's a lot that goes into it, including in the era of Black Lives Matter, how the culinary world is not exempt from issues of imperialism and cultural appropriation, and now creatives must navigate these potential landmines. So let's go take a look. Just thinking about a simple twist on a Chinese one, so maybe like salted fish with pork hash. Mm -hmm. Then there's Ooh, just, just there's a lot of different thoughts on them. You know what I mean? Like maybe crabby mayo, maybe turnips, maybe smoked trout roll, maybe Parisians of green apple. Then, you know, a lot of these ideas get mixed eventually. Just to think about them so when I negate them, when we say no to the idea, it's the, it's the fact, when it's distilled, it's the fact that you said no to a lot of other options. So you're a lot more confident in yourself about the options that you actually chose and the profiles and the directions you want to go into. This is just mm -hmm. like a whole different set that mm -hmm. just ideas that aren't even aren't even gonna be like pursued. Mm -hmm. What did you? What was the goal? I don't know. I was thinking summer, so we were thinking corn ravioli. We were thinking not too crazy. Mm -hmm. So thinking about corn affinities, maybe pumpkin and then chicken mousse, maybe sukune style chicken mm -hmm. instead. Then sage. Then like what else that follows it? Then another idea like oh maybe truffle. Mm -hmm. Then a porcini glaze, and then we're like, oh man, put those things together. Mm -hmm. Then you know, like, what else goes from there? When I think of that, then I think black garlic. Then we go, hmm, should we put some confit tomatoes? Mm -hmm. How about the sauce? Maybe corn silk, brown butter, sage. You know what I mean? I don't know. Smoked hazelnuts. Mm -hmm. A corny chicken sukune. Mm -hmm. You know. Why some... did this one get mixed right off the bat? Oh, just because I wanted to eat something else. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. It's, it's, I think everybody wants to eat a corn ravioli. Yeah, I mean, but it's 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 not simple to to think about it. You know, what I mean, it's just about like what is worth pursuing mm -hmm. and what can be done feasibly in the style of the restaurant that you're in. Because you can't put you know twenty touches on every single plate in a family style restaurant. It makes no sense. The reason why dumplings came up is because of COVID. To be honest. Mm -hmm. Taking into account COVID, there's a feeling that I get, you know, where people like, when they gather, they kind of want to gather, you know what I mean? The beautiful thing about EXO is that we have the style of restaurant that's kind of like Chinese, you know, it's family style. Mm -hmm. And so it's nice to be able to have another dynamic of a dish that is like everyone reaches for the same thing together, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So a lot of times sets that we've had in the past are just like, oh, what do you think tastes good with this? Or what do you like to eat? And then just goes, I think this is going to be good. And we try to teach the cooks to break things down into profiles and textures, you know what I'm saying? 
herbaceous, like what hits you in the first note, second, third, what comes back, where is it still resting, you know what I mean, what sensations are you getting, how long did that crunch or that crisp last, you know what I mean, how long did this chew last, you know what I mean, down to the point that they can learn how to taste like, oh, I can taste the level of gelatin in the jus because of how long it lingers, you know, on your tongue. So when it comes to dumplings, we wanted to be able to look at some of the things firstly that are already nostalgic. Because, well one, it's, it's a, in my creative process, it's a little, I'm realizing that it's a little bit better. People are, the guests are going to feel a little bit more safer if you pull something that's a little bit closer to home and then you just slightly twist it versus trying to reinvent the wheel all the time. You know, like, uh, putting beef fat, grill, like grilled beef fat on a ahi poke, for example. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the one you had? Oh, I just read something about that. That there's like this golden formula where you have to be different, but not too different. Because if you go to hmm. re really different, then people don't like it. Even though they say they want something new, they really don't. They want something familiar with a little bit novelty. Wow! Now that you mentioned that, yeah, it's exactly how, what I've been thinking now. For this one so just slight twists you know what i mean ideas always come so for one of them it's going to be a bao we're working on that but when it comes to like like a trasu bao you know just one part of that set is already like the whole world of things to consider first thing i consider as like a little local kid that used to grow up eating that in chinatown is how we used to judge trasu baos is all right how much filling is there, man? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How's this place compared to that place? Mm -hmm. And you go, well, for the most part, they all kind of taste like similar across the board, right? Mm -hmm. With some variations. Mm -hmm. The ones that are really exceptional will stand out, but the most exceptional part of that is like, all right, how well can this thing like hold up? How well is it filled? How soft, how glutinous is the bao? Now that I've been cooking for, you know, 12 years, it's instead of it just being oh filling and soft, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's what kind of umami are they using? You know what I mean? What kind of sweet are they using? What like because syrup in in a marinade or a, a glaze tastes looks and tastes different than honey. Honey and that they taste different than maltos, which is what traditionally Chinese Chinese people use. You know what I mean? Packaged li kum ki char su sauce that's like doctored up tastes pretty much good across the board but when you do your research you're like the Chinese <laughs> they have their own in initial version of like they didn't use no bottle sauce yeah they have their own like <laughs> their, their own type of like red miso mm -hmm. you know what I mean and that's like the real thing that they use you oh, know what I'm saying so how much time do you actually like spend reading and researching <laughs> a long time <laughs> I mean it's one of those things where like even if you're not able to if I can't do all of those things, the fact that I can study as far as that makes me aspire to that kind of, of level. You know what I mean? At the very least, I may not be able to get a Chinese like fermented red bean mm -hmm. that they have. Mm -hmm. But maybe with what I can access, I can get Akamis. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can't use, maybe I can't find maltose, which I've really been looking for. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, maybe, 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 maybe glucose could be better. You think like char siu bao, and then I think strawberry char siu bao, and like that works. It works automatically, you know what I mean? Just because you can see that like, yo, one, well one, it's red. <laughs> Two, it's sweet. Three, there's a level of tart that is necessary to balance that out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you want something sweet, sometimes you want something umami, but a little bit of acid in that case it helps to frame both sweet and umami so they're not too stuff they're not too one dimensional on their own us learning together the relationships between these profiles gives us the most freedom to be able to to play with these things with the most intention another dish that we have that i'm working on this one is um this was actually inspired by my mentor patrick collins or he's one of my mentors he was one of the, he was the, the sous chef at uh, Senia. You know, it, the beautiful thing about that place was that, you know, you had, you had Rush, you had Kaji, and you had Pat. 
So two years there was different because you had three chefs to learn from in three different styles. Mm -hmm. One of the sets that he made for one of the tasting sets was this uh, squid ink crepe beggar's purse. So you know one, you know, you know one is this, mm -hmm. you just tie a little garlic chive. Yeah. It's black. Mm -hmm. And then he made like an abalone luau. Mm -hmm. Abalone squid luau. And I was like, pow, pow, this is fucking amazing. <laughs> he had a little like a chili pepper water and then like some inamono. And then I was like, all right, one, we can't afford abalone here. <laughs> like so. Two, I want to eat butterfish instead with that. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking with some of the cooks, you know, I was talking with Bo and I was like, what do you think would be good with that, with those affinities? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He's like, maybe like a coconut vinaigrette. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. And then now when it comes to applying that, it's like considering how each of these textures play on each other. Because you can have a broken vinaigrette and you're going to taste them more farther. Mm -hmm. You're going to taste oil, then you're going to taste vinegar. If you have an emulsified vinaigrette, a homogenized vinaigrette, you're gonna taste all of them almost singing as a chord, you know what I mean, versus a melody. Then let's say you add a gelling agent, like agar, to a vinaigrette, and suddenly that emulsified vinaigrette doesn't just stay as a chord, it lingers on your tongue more. So it just, hmm, maybe that's better for this kind of application because I can't afford to like, drizzle it all over because it's not gonna be on the plate. I want the butterfish in the luau because well one it, it, it it's kind of like it reminds you of like a like a la la you know what i mean mm -hmm. like, like this is this one's very like close to exact exactly what my memory of like of Pat, of patrick is that's why mm -hmm. but just a little bit more fatty <laughs> you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and a little bit more unctuous mm -hmm. well, that so, would be unusual too because i haven't seen butterfish in any of the chinese dim sum yet yeah, but the thing is, we're the the beautiful thing about EXO is that we're we're you know a lot of we're we're second gens. Mm -hmm. So I didn't grow up eating that only. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I grew up eating that as much as I ate mm -hmm. Filipino food, as much as I ate McDonald's, as much as I ate you know what I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> like school lunch. You know. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it, for the like, you know, second or third gen kids, especially nowadays, mm -hmm. like having the palate for all of these things mm -hmm. is. <laughs> it's a given, you know what I mean? We talk about chop suey palette before, but it's extreme now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's chop suey palette with modern American, you know what I mean? Like with now even like uh, an even higher degree of like right. global in influence. Right, because before it was just everybody on the plantation. And yes. Now it's like Middle East, it's Southeast Asia. Exactly. Places that weren't in the original plantation yeah. profile yeah it, it's it's a, it's definitely a, a beautiful thing to consider that that local cuisine is is, is like that mm -hmm. you know it's it's gonna be weird to say but it's an even more important thing to consider how this you know this is not creative i'm not gonna i don't know why i'm saying this a very important thing to consider too how even local food is violent mm -hmm. because local food is still an erasure of indigenous Hawaiian food mm -hmm. and I say that as a grandson of a Sakata you know what I mean my grand uncle was a Sakata you know he came here for the American dream but we all came here because we're inheritors of that American dream during that time of, Im of American imperialism. But, you know, ultimately, you know, this, you know, like, luau too is, you know, to, to co opt that is like, it's still a form of appropriation from someone that's a local settler. Mm -hmm. Which is, uh, which is a very complex thing to, to consider. Mm -hmm. Chefs have a responsibility to do this, otherwise we continue to push a narrative that says locals, I am not Kanaka Maori. So I'm I am I'm local, I am a settler colonizer. Chefs as proponents of culture have a responsibility 
in Hawaii to to acknowledge that, to start those conversations. But you know, being able to be creative in this aspect is a nice thing. Mm -hmm. It's a privilege mm -hmm. because you know, honestly, it's it's the only thing louder than destruction. You know, it's the only chance that hey things that are moving forward things that, as things change they can still taste good and they can they might even taste better when you make it you put all this care in but then when you eat it we like in the, in the restaurant we have to be our own worst enemies we have to be the harshest critics against ourselves we have to take away our own hearts to look at it we're still gonna work on it you know we're still, oh. we're still doing some more mm -hmm. so but, what is what um, okay, so over here, mm -hmm. that one is a uh, salt cod, like a chalangbao. Mm -hmm. The squid ink, oh my gosh, the luau and butterfish, mm -hmm. beggar's purse, mm -hmm. squid ink crepe, mm -hmm. the yuba pipi kaula mac nut. Mm -hmm. Working on that one. Mm -hmm. Strawberry char siu bao, still, okay. yeah, still needs to be fluffier. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, what's it called? It's a beaten egg pasta with eggplant, roasted eggplant, some, uh, bunch of other stuff, some tomatoes, some garlic. There's a little, it's a jalo sauce around it, some mint, xantar, and lemon confit! <laughs> yeah, working, working on the set, still yet, you know. Wow, so elaborate. Sheesh. Gotta go this way so you see the, the little pieces. <laughs> yeah. So what worked, like how you thought it would and, and what didn't and where did you have to start, uh, start again? Well, I mean, honestly, the only thing I'm familiar with is like Italian pasta. Mm -hmm. And like these, this, the beggar's purse and that one is like, just like riffs on stuff that my, my mentor did. Mm -hmm. The other ones, very big learning experience. Uh -huh. Do you remember me talking about um, you know, just trying to like learn as much as you can so you can appreciate that? Man, <laughs> it's one thing to research. It's so nice to research. It's, it's so much tougher when you just keep failing. Mm -hmm. You know, like the the pleats on the on the shalong bao. Mm -hmm. Just just like watching like those Din Tai Fung videos. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Just like every little motion, like why do you use the stick this size? Mm -hmm. How how much pressure are they putting? Like mm -hmm. how much protein is in their flour? Mm -hmm. What's the hydration level? What's the effect of fat in the dough? You know, what's the... Man. What part of the dough do you hold up when you start doing your pleats? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? How do you get five grams of dough to be that thin? Mm -hmm. I don't have bread flour, so how do I up the protein with all purpose? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it's crazy because when you watch them do it, it takes them like seconds yeah. to finish one dumpling. Yeah, and, and make it look so easy. Yeah. And, and then when you try it, it's like, oh, this is awkward. This is tough. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're right. It's. I think. I think the funniest part about it though is like, you know, just sitting, like, standing around with the cooks and just trying to make it, and like. How's your pleats going? This is horrible. This sucks. Why did you make us do this? I, like, I don't know. I don't know why I did this either. I don't know why I chose to make this. This is um, the Yubo one was like I want to eat pipi kaula. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's weird and put in a dumpling. So let's, let's let's find a way to make it work. And you know, there's different schools of like pipi kaula as well. You know, like the one some is like cured and smoked. I personally like the Helena style. You know what I mean? Just like like marinated in like soy base kind of stuff. And then after it marinades, just let it dry. Mm -hmm. Then we were, we were doing the test as to like how chewy the meat was to be. We deep fried it at different levels of dryness. And when it was too early, it was like, oh, this is too tender and juicy. Just seems counterintuitive. Like, oh, you want, don't you always want tender and juicy? Mm -hmm. But for a flavor that just brings me back, like that, that chew, that juicy like chew, mm -hmm. it was, the meat basically looks like almost like leather you know what I mean mm -hmm. like this is kind of this is like a little too dry bro you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. then you know just talking with like my friends talking with the cooks 
I was like, if, it, if you had Yuba, Pipi Kala, I mean, Mac Nut, what would you think? And then like two people, unrelated, both were like garlic. And I was like, garlic, okay. How about garlic chive? Because the affinity pulls it a little bit more towards like the scallion leek, you know, area, but still garlic flavor. The texture is really nice as well. And then when we thought about the cohesiveness of picking it up, you know what I mean? It's gonna split. So I needed to find like a bland way a textural way to be able to hold the flavors together and so we just made a mousse out of some uh, some chicken thighs and then we made a little roulade from there and then steamed it chilled it and then put the yuba around it hydrated it wrapped it seared it on all the sides and just cut it and then we let it finish in the steamer the bow um you know my my cook is working on the on the dough recipe. It's mm -hmm. it's still a work in progress. It's not fluffy, but you know what? He was. It, it, we're gonna get there. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get there. You know, we are going to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, it was funny because uh, like what, the, what's the what was the challenge uh, for him? Uh, he just never worked with that kind of style. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like Chinese, like Eastern, like style of cuisine. Even though there's like breads and and pastas. It's very different types of like methods of making it, you know? So it's, a lot of it is like trying to like unlearn what you currently know so you can like try and appreciate it as much as you can. Another part for the filling of the bao was uh, try making like that strawberry char siu base and I remember Kenny was like, this tastes artificial. And I'm like, all right, cool. I am gonna go to Boa in Chinatown and just buy like just I'm gonna get Chinese sugar, I'm gonna get some maltose, and then I'm gonna make my own five spice. I'm gonna, in addition to the other stuff I was telling you a couple weeks ago, um, and you know, it really helps you to appreciate the ingredients that they have. Because it's one of those things where, like, until you actually use like maltose in the chasu when we made it, that taffy like, like stick to your teeth almost like that, it feels like a light film, that's, that's all maltose being caramelized. But it just behaves so differently from other sugars that you don't realize that you were missing it mm -hmm. until it's not there. And then when it's there, you're like, oh, that's actually what it was. So that experience for a lot of these things, you know, it's, it's hard because sometimes, you know, when, you, when we gram out these recipes, like, for example, the butterfish in here, you know what I mean? Even just having, like, base flavors. Luau. Always tasty. Butterfish, tasty. You know what I mean? You put them together, it didn't work for me. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, the, the texture of like a, like a lightly seared butterfish is still too soft. Mm -hmm. But even, even before we started doing that, you know, we had to, you know, like activate some, uh, some shiokoji. So that takes like seven days before you can even touch the fish just for the rice to get to that level of, uh, you know, that, that amount of bacteria. So it breaks down the proteins and the sugars. So it gives, makes it taste more of itself. Then you mix the, some shiokoji with some white miso. We marinated it. And then I took aside the, the marinating liquid and you, we just put it under a heat lamp. And like after a couple hours, it gets like really thick, like, like it's been under a lamp the entire time, you know? But it cooks really slowly and gets caramelized really nicely and it dries out very evenly. And then when it's like pasty, we'll recoat the marinated butterfish in that and then we'll cook it under the heat lamp again from raw. That way it gets to that level of like crust, especially since butterfish is so forgiving and fatty. It gets to that level of crust that when you add it to the luau, um, there's that textural change. It's not just soft fish and like soft lua, but the fact that it's a little bit crusty, you can, just that little textural note, that little drier note in the middle, just makes you taste both of them a lot more. And then when we're eating it, we're like still missing something. And so it literally takes, I would say maybe a quarter of a gram. It sounds so, <laughs> so small, but like just a quarter of a gram of like some Benton's bacon that we just like just seared up 
just a little bit of that pork fat, you know what I mean? Because you, you still want that pork. You, you, you're thinking about it, but you know, if you don't have it, it's missing. And suddenly it just, it just rounded it out. Like pe when people say that they taste the love in it, mm -hmm. I think as a, as a chef, it, to me, it really means like I'm tasting how much time they took to care about their technique. Because like love is nice, but love won't make this. You know what I mean? It's about understanding the smallest things. Like that is a 65% hydration. You know, like this in relationship to the other parts. Like it has to be like a two to one to a three to one gel to solids. The salt cod in here, when you take it, it's you have to make sure you clean it well. You have to get rid of all the little extra scales around it. Make sure you take out all the bones of a dried fish, which is already difficult enough. Then it doesn't taste good enough on its own. So you just, just deep fry it to concentrate the salt and make it a little bit crustier. And then every every little thing, you know what I mean? Just like even the squid ink crepe, if it's 30 seconds under or, or 30 seconds above when you're making that crepe, suddenly it's too dry or it's just, just it's not gonna pull up. You know? <laughs> you're gonna eat like one small thing and you like no one's gonna know like, oh okay, this was 145 degrees for six hours, you know what I mean? This was marinated for two days, had the, Shogoji inoculated for seven days, cooked under a heat lamp for two hours, you know what I mean? This thing not reduced, you know what I mean? They don't they don't taste that. It just has to be good. But this man, it's just, I, 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 I wanted to document this too. I was like, man, this is this is this is too much. So if I wanted to video everything, I would be here a week. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Like, oh man. Like every little discipline that this helps to learn it's like it crosses into other forms of cooking mm -hmm. you know what i mean so it just makes you stronger the more you learn and the more we learn we also refine more too you know which is <laughs> tough but okay you survived so far <laughs> yeah uh, it's 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 fun and it's like what one more week to go yeah yeah <laughs>